On behalf of Zero de Malta, I'm very happy and proud to introduce this outstanding webinar on the needs and stories of male survivors of child sexual abuse, exploitation, and human trafficking. First, let me thank Ena Lucia Maria Carpacheco for her clear and moving presentation, the result of a five-year-long research project. She has demonstrated a unique academic experience, expertise, and through her research has gained the trust of many survivors and the respect of many experts. With Dr. Glenn Miles, I had the opportunity to be in the jury of her dissertation on this very topic at the Royal Rhodes University in Vancouver, BC, Canada. She introduced us now in this webinar uh, to the first speaker, the survivor, Jeffrey Tennant. Jeffrey was once a victim and is now an activist. He has experienced deep suffering and nevertheless recovered through sharing his story to a compassionate listener. He will explain his journey by recounting his suffering, his hope, and the need to find true compassion and understanding. He emphasizes the need for training in order to avoid putting victims in successive re-victimation. He is the author of a book, The Way of Escape, the true story of a teenage boy's miraculous escape from sex traffickers and her healing journey of recovery. Allow me to quote Jeffrey. I believe this book is a gift of hope, not only for victims, of course to victims, but for people that love them and advocate for them and even perpetrators. There is hope. There is a way of escape for you, for each one out of darkness and into that place of light and love. I am so thankful to have been able to be a part of that book. End of quote. Dr. Glenn Miles, who shall speak after Jeffrey, has also a long history of academic research and operational practice. He wrote two books with survivors. The first, Stopping the Trafficking, a Christian response to sexual exploitation and trafficking in 2014. Second, finding our way through the trafficking, navigating the complexities of a Christian response to sexual exploitation and trafficking, published in 2017. All aforementioned books, as well as Enna's dissertation, are available online, as well as the webinar handout from Enna Lucia Maria Capacheco. And here are key questions which shall be answered in the forthcoming exchange. First, what are some of the unique ch challenges that male victims might face in the aftermath of abuse? Second, what advice would you give male victims and survivors who are struggling to overcome their traumas? Third, how could training include not only professional approaches for medical doctors, nurses, police, priests, but also and foremost the human approach to treat survivors as human beings and listen to them in respect for their dignity. And now, without further ado, let me give the floor to Ena Lucia Mariaka Pacheco. Ena, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Michael. It is such a pleasure to be here today and an honor to speak to you and your audience. So you're about to see a video that I've prepared on my research, as well as a panel discussion on today's topic of male survivorhood of human trafficking. So thank you very much for your attention. Hello, and welcome to the webinar today. My name is Ana Lucia Maria Capacheco. And today's webinar will include a presentation on my research on the needs and stories of male survivors of child sexual abuse and exploitation and human trafficking. And that will be followed by a panel discussion with myself, Dr. Glenn Miles, and Jeffrey Tennant. Thank you. So what inspired this research? 
After working in this field for many years, I have to admit I was very female focused. I worked with women and children, and I had no idea about the magnitude of male victims and what they suffered. And it was only when I read a report while working at Interpol that stated that boys, infants, and toddlers were at the greatest risk of severe online sexual abuse, and that really hit me. This report stated that boys were more likely to be subject to severe abuse, such as assault, bestiality, and torture, um, which were at the highest levels of the coping scale. And the coping scale is how law enforcement measures the intensity of abuse um, when it comes to images or videos when doing analysis. And this broke my heart. I thought to myself that if this is true, which it is, why isn't more being done? So this is why I went into research for male victims. It revealed a huge gap, not only in the academic literature, but within global and local projects, policy, news, media, and general awareness. This changed my life and direction, and I wanted to be a researcher that included everyone, everyone's story, their, no matter what their gender, ethnicity, religion, or social status. So this research looked into the negative and positive interactions survivors have over their journey of healing. So we can see here and compare the two sides. In the negative side, we see that disbelief is a very big factor that harms survivors. So many survivors, when disclosing their sexual exploitation, were met with skepticism and disbelief and a lack of understanding of grooming tactics. And they were met with an overly gender bias, whereas whereby the person whereby the person disclosing to explicitly dismiss the existence of male victimhood and in some cases, female culpability to the survivors, ultimately resulting in police, mental health professionals, and medical staff taking no action on their behalf. And on the positive side, we see survivors healing, feeling respected, feeling human again by being able to be listened to and believed for the very first time or even afterwards. So if we just read some of these quotes, we can see um, in law enforcement when uh, the child or the, the man later on was supposed to tell their story to law enforcement. So he says, I wasn't equip equipped to retelling my story to too many different people. When I was telling my statement, my mind just wasn't OK. And at the end, they didn't even believe me. So this was a child being asked over and over again, tell us what happened, tell us what happened. And so it's a lot better to have just one or two where there is audio and visual uh, recording so the child doesn't have to keep going through that very traumatic experience. And over on the positive side, the police officer listened to my story and she believed me. It was the first time someone believed me and it gave me courage to finally report it. This um, quote comes from an adult survivor who eventually had the courage to tell um, the police of what was happening. And luckily, this police officer was trauma informed and trained to listen to trafficking survivors and actually took action um, on behalf and created a case. So when comparing the top answers by survivors and experts on what has been most detrimental, we see the top answers do not fully align. For experts, the top answered was being untrained. And for survivors, their top answers ascribe experiences of denial by the perpetrators, committing the crimes, unbelief, or having, the, or having their pain minimized, feeling fear, disrespect, or being re-traumatized. Therefore, as much as experts want a solution of training first, we really need to remember that victims and survivors are people first, with very human needs, such as being listened to, feeling respected, regaining a sense of dignity, and core human rights need to be placed first before we can even address the problem. So as we can see here in the list, um, it is very different on each side. So this really showed um, the experts that were a part of this study that maybe their number one priority is wrong and our focus is always let's help the survivor and we have to train more we have to learn more we have to do more but in re reality we just really need to sit back and listen um, to start 
So when thinking about reintegration after trauma, most victims remain stuck in a cycle as we see here. Occurrence, when the abuse is happening, silence, not discussing it, era of acting out, this can be drug abuse, alcoholism, failed relationships, and if there's no intervention at this point, the victim continues to stage four, lifelong ramifications. And many men face consequences such as divorce, lack of contact with their children, alcoholism, drug addiction, depression, life term, uh, long-term health consequences, and even suicide. And if we can see in the United States, um, this is one of your biggest issues is the suicide of men. So I really hope that we can go back and stop this era of um, silence. So in order to do this, the results of the study suggested that intervention in form of personal action um, is needed towards inquiry and support and services are the foundation of healing. So in addition to establishing community as an essential in disrupting the cycle of silence and begin the social reintegration and inner healing, the findings demonstrate the importance of the survivor to break their silence and begin their healing process. And so we can see this process in these blue uh, blocks. And on the next slide, we'll see what survivors had said that they did at each stage to help them move forward. To go forward into healing, the survivors need to first recognize that a traumatic experience has happened and not minimize their story to themselves or continue to suppress any emotion, thought, or memories of their exploitation or abuse. This is very hard. I'm not going to say that this is easy, but it is needed. And after they begin the process to understand more about what happened, they can start to make community with trusted peers that support them and eventually lead to mental and emotional support from trained professionals and finally treat different aspects of their trauma, such as addiction, complex PTSD, eating disorders, alcoholism, etc. This healing can then allow for relationship building and seek and seeking what brings them joy. So these last steps allow for survivors to live more in freedom and happiness and in their own truth. And so a, a few of these examples are shown here, but the all of the examples are in the research paper, but as well in the handout that I've created for today's uh, session. So here are some recommendations for frontline professionals. As a result of this research, um, survivors told us um, in, in this that they received significantly more effective help from service providers who use trauma-informed practices. And I highly recommend um, people getting training in, in this particular uh, field. Service providers are in a better position to help survivors if they know beforehand how to recognize indicators and how to support victims of child sexual exploitation. This in particular is important for familial perpetrators or female perpetrators um, because the indicators might be presented even if a boy attends school, participates in extracurricular activities, or even goes home to his family every day. I recommend that survivors be provided with a choice in which gender um, of a trauma-informed professional that they disclose to and work with. And so this is especially important when they have reported being fearful of a man, um, especially if they had a very traumatic experience with, um, with male sexual violence in their past. This just allows for an easier disclosure where they can feel safe and vice versa um, if they I want a man that should be uh, provided as well. Um, I also recommend that frontline professionals educate educators and other service providers in regular contact with children receive trauma informed training on detecting um, potential victims of child sexual exploitation. And these training activities must contain contact that in that address familial perpetrators, um, male victims, and uh, female perpetrators. And I also believe that training uh, to raise awareness on gender bias can help. Um, as the participants repeatedly told me that their claims were met with skepticism when they, um, that when they told someone that they were victims, as well as female criminality. Um, this kind of training may help professionals in contact 
with them to remain objective with their interactions and provide better support. So the research has brought together men of many different walks of life. For some, I was the very first person that they told, and for others, they were learning and healing. And finally, the thrivers who had their ups and downs, but have found joy, love, and happiness again. So here are some recommendations from all of them. Number one, uh, they say, please review the what has been most helpful to male survivors journey document. Um, because it can be a helpful guide in the healing journey. Again, this is in the handout. And number two, um, you do not have to be public about what happened, but finding a safe and trusted individual to share your story will help lift the burden that you've been carrying for all these years. You do not want to feel trapped in a jail cell within your own body. Just find one, two people that you trust, and that will really help your soul. And finally, if you have symptoms of abuse or exploitation, it is really important to address those. Don't minimize your story to yourself. Let yourself feel, let yourself heal. And this will be a journey, a long one, but there is healing and there is hope. Thank you for listening to that presentation. We are now about to begin a panel discussion with Dr. Glenn Miles and Jeffrey Tennant. Thank you. The journey of a male survivor of trauma is often complex and challenging, with many facing unique obstacles that can make recovery and healing difficult. One of the most significant challenges is the stigma and the societal expectations around masculinity, which can make it harder for male survivors to disclose their experiences and seek help. This can lead to feelings of isolation and shame, further complicating the healing process. However, there are many societal interactions and support systems that can aid male recovery and survivor recovery. It is important to explore and identify these in order to provide better support and resources for those that have experienced trauma. In this discussion, we will go deeper into the barriers that hinder disclosure and the social interactions that both harm and aid male survivors in recovery and healing. It is absolutely wonderful to welcome two incredible individuals who have had a big impact on my life today. And I welcome here them here to this talk. Jeffrey Tennant began his career in aerospace, and after retiring, he made significant changes in his life by serving those around him through ministry and at the beginning of his writing career. The ministry of vocation came naturally from volunteering through his life. But the writing career was birthed from the detailing of the struggles to healing from the pain and trauma brought on from being sex trafficked. The desire to help others traveling the same road as he has led to the writing and publishing of his first book, The Way of Escape. The true story of a teenage boy's miraculous escape from sex traffickers and a healing journey of recovery. When not working, Jeffrey enjoys life with his family and friends, reading, hiking, weight training, cycling, playing guitar, and writing songs. Dr. Glenn Miles is a senior researcher with UP International, and for 25 years he's led INGOs and facilitated research listening to survivors of sexual exploitation, including men and women and boys and girls, as well as transgendered people as well as researching those with, that have been sex buyers. Glenn teaches graduate and PhD candidates and provides supervision and advises the Butterfly Longitudinal Project, Chad Dye. And Dr. Glenn Miles was also on my thesis committee board and a co-writer with the latest research on familial trafficking of boys. And my name is Ana Lucia Maria Capacheco, and I am a trauma-informed professional in human security with a master's specialization in male survivors of child sexual abuse and human trafficking for sexual exploitation. I've worked with the government of Canada, NGOs, law enforcement, and international organizations on anti-trafficking, advocacy work, database, casework, and global projects. I'm also a member of the Global Association of Human Trafficking Scholars, and the author of The Needs and Stories of Male Survivors of Child Sexual Abuse, Exploitation, and Human Trafficking. 
So big thank you to Dr. Glenn Miles and Jeffrey Tennant for being here with me today as we talk about human trafficking healing post-traumatic growth for male survivors. Jeffrey and Glenn, thank you so much for joining me here today. And I would like to open up this safe space and invite you to share your story with us, Jeffrey. And when you're ready and comfortable, we are here to listen and acknowledge your story as a lived expert. Well, thank you so much, Gina. And uh, thank you, Glenn and, and Michael and, and all of you, uh, your audience, Michael. It's amazing you all have compassionate hearts that they want to be a part of the solution. So thank you for the privilege to be able to share and be a part of what you're all doing as well. Uh, and uh, um, what happened to me, I was uh, 17 years old and I was on a youth uh, church trip out to Colorado to do uh, some benevolence work. We were going to rehab uh, an elderly ladies home in Leadville, Colorado. And uh, so we were going to do that for a week and then, uh, get to go have fun in, in uh, Colorado. Uh, and uh, what happened was I had a, a girlfriend and uh, she called it a frantic call in the middle of the uh, night uh, at the end of the work week. And uh, and I was in a panic uh, being young and, and I had just had to get home to her right there, I guess, to rescue her. And so uh, I, I was able to go to the bus depot in Denver, Colorado. Uh, I arrived there shortly, uh, maybe a half hour, hour before sunrise. And uh, and so I was going to be unescorted and go uh, home to St. Louis on a bus. And uh, so uh, I was approached by a an elderly man who was very clean cut. He reminded me of one of my friend's fathers who was the superintendent of the school district that I lived in. So I was, he set me at ease and he helped me to get into my locker and, and made some conversation and and I hadn't eaten anything, so uh, he offered to take me uh, to a, a place to get uh, breakfast. And well, what wound up happening was he he gave me a drink and the car ride, and it was drugged. And then he took me to uh, what um, uh, I later found out uh, after all the work I did and memory recoveries uh, was probably a sex trafficking operation similar. Uh, to um, somebody like Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, for this to operate in, in uh, the downtown Denver area, it seemed like it was the basement of a high rise and it was like an auction. And so what they did was operant conditioning on, I was the only male that I could see and there were many young females, um, you know, right around that age, probably 14 to uh, 16, 17, like myself, a very young 17, I was very late uh, bloomer. And uh, and so uh, they, they used uh, drugs, fear, violence, um, and uh, even a female perpetrator uh, with me uh, to kind of seduce me. And then uh, their ultimate goal, I believe, was to um, uh, uh, turn me towards males you know, for, uh, for sexuality. And um, and apparently, they're uh, uh, they're just. It was a very high powered, high, well funded operation. I would say that uh, my estimation would be that they would are going to take the young people and sell them internationally and ship them out of the Denver International Airport. And uh, but through, uh, I cried out to the uh, Lord Jesus, and uh, He rescued me. And um, uh, he, uh, they actually saw I wasn't going to cooperate at the end there, and they uh, just probably tried to overdose me and, and actually did, and the Lord brought me back. And uh, while they thought I was dead, um, the Lord just met, or actually got me up and helped me to walk right past them. They didn't even see me, um, and I was able to break out of a window on the second floor and jump down and run to safety. And um, so that was, in essence, what happened. Um, and so I'm um, very thankful to be here. And I want to uh, just, uh, I, uh, if I could, uh, I don't want to uh, go too far into what's in the book, uh, but um, I, the Lord brought me a lot of healing because uh, after all the work that I went through, uh, with the counseling and then EMDR counseling like they have for war veterans 
and the memory started coming back because I had PTSD 30 years later. I had absolutely no memory of what had happened that day, no conscious memory. Uh, but then uh, PTSD symptoms started showing up a few years before they hit full force. And I didn't even know what was happening. I didn't even know what PTSD was. I had to Google it, <laughs> what, what, what I was experiencing. And I was desperate for help. And uh, I was just um, so uh, thankful for all the people that did help me uh, along the way. And uh, of course, that trauma impacts every other area of your life. But uh, miraculously, I was able to marry and, and have a wonderful family and, and have a really a very normal life. Uh, but I guess it was just time to to heal, and uh, and so I was just uh, so thankful for all the people along the way. But there was absolutely no roadmap that I had uh, to go through, and the Lord just guided me uh, day by day um, on what to do. And it was not an easy journey. And uh, some people um, uh, people will wonder why don't you just um, try to go get healed right away well there's pain involved in the healing process but for me it was the the pain of staying where i was uh, uh, had become much greater than uh, pressing forward and, and trusting that uh, everything was going to be okay oh and i, I did uh, want to uh, share just one more thing it's okay uh Ina. Of and course. that is uh, yeah, one of the um, after working through all the you know the practical things, the counseling, the MDR, uh, self education on uh, sexual trauma and things like that, um, I, I think one of the things that brought greatest healing uh, to my uh, to me, um, my heart and soul, was that uh, yeah, during time with uh, prayer with the Lord. Uh, I don't know how to describe the experience. Uh, it probably happened in just a, f a few seconds at most, but I, I could write a whole book on it. Uh, but it was like the Lord took me back there because you're wondering, where's this good God when all this happened to me? And I had survivor's guilt too because uh, the girls didn't get away like I did. And so in a moment, he showed me the whole scene it was like in the basement of this huge high rise, probably in Denver, downtown ben Denver somewhere with these great uh, concrete pillars. And, and I saw the whole line of girls and myself, like you know, bright lights on us and dark everywhere else. But uh, the Lord just, uh, just in a moment, let me know he was there, even though it seemed like I was abandoned. And he was there for the girls. And uh, I just knew, somehow I just knew he had a way of escape for them as well, but it was going to look different than mine. And, uh, and he was even reaching out for the perpetrators. And I was like, I could see one of the perpetrators was responding uh, to the Lord's call to them to turn from what they're doing. Uh, but he was hidden behind one of the pillars and he was breaking down crying. And uh, I'm sure he had to hide or they would have probably killed him if they had seen him uh, doing that. But that brought so much healing to my heart uh, because that's uh, even though I, ha I had great faith in the Lord, it just shook me to my core. And that's what happens with trauma. It just blows your out of the uh, water uh, beyond your grid uh, uh, function and it, it tries to steal your trust. And um but uh, through uh, God's help and people like Ina and Glenn and Michael and his audience um, and, and with y'all with compassionate hearts, uh, part of the uh, healing that he brought to me. So thank you so much again for the opportunity to share. Thank you so much, Jeffrey, for sharing your story with us. Glenn, do you have any um, comments or Things that you would like to share with Jeffrey after listening to his story? It's an incredible story, and um, yeah, I'm very grateful that you had that experience of of Jesus bringing you into the light. And that was, um, and to be able to recognize that He was there with you—that's a very profound 
experience in itself. And thank you for sharing that. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you so much, Glenn. Yeah, Jeffrey, in, in so much trauma, yet there is so much potential for healing and growth. Um, but like you said, it is a painful journey to go to that. And um, and I feel like that is what stops so many survivors, regardless of gender, to mm -hmm. start that healing process, um, which actually will goes right into our, our conversation. Um, and if that's OK with you, too, I'd like to ask you a couple questions. Sure. So, Jeffrey, what has been most helpful to you in your healing journey after your traumatic experience of human trafficking? Sure. Um, definitely um, um, my relationship with the Lord Jesus. Um, I, I just uh, had him uh, to go to and, um, and, and he helped me along the way. But I will say I was at, at times angry with the Lord. Um, because you just can't understand, um, you know, how something like that can happen. And, um, cause it not only impacts you, of course, it impacts the other people in your life. And, uh, but that's, um, you know, he's, uh, he's given people free will and they make their choices and people's bad choices do impact us. And, uh, but he's, uh, giving me a way to uh, just forgive people. It never makes what they've done right ever. And uh, that's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is just releasing uh, vengeance uh, to God and, um, and just uh, asking for his healing. And then uh, taking that pain, uh, I believe, is what he's helped me and turning it around positively. Uh, to reach out and help others. And so I, I, I'm willing to do uh, whatever it takes in this area that he would have me do uh, to uh, help people. Uh, as Ina and uh, Glenn and Michael and, and your audience uh, to educate people on what's going on. Uh, and also it, uh, first responders and advocates and also um, uh, people that uh, love uh, people that have been traumatized uh, like that. So, um, I, I, and I believe uh, I'll be writing more books um, because I'm continually learning and, um, and uh, also uh, uh, writing some songs and the, and it won't be a dark subject. It'll be full of hope because um, uh, when, when you've, uh, just been able to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and um, and um, you begin to fear no evil because uh, he really is with you, he really is with me. And I realize he's with me and not just everyone else, but, but me. And, and um, that is the greatest comfort and strength we could ever have in our lives. Uh, yeah. And I, I would like to say just a quick caveat. Um, and I'm so sorry for anyone that has uh, been victimized or people they love been victimized by someone who is supposed to represent a God and, and Jesus Christ. Because that is not who God is. He is love. He loved us so much. He sent Jesus and, to, and gave him. He took all of our uh, punishment and our sins upon himself so that we can have a relationship with the Lord. And, um, and so I'm so sorry for anyone that's experienced that trauma that I can't imagine what that's like. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it was, uh, at least in my young mind, it was evil people doing that. But it, if someone who's supposed to be God or Jesus representative to me, where do I have to go? So I'm so sorry for that, but that is not who he is. And uh, there is the genuine. There are counterfeits, but if there's a counterfeit, there's a genuine. Hmm. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, for that, uh, that answer. That was absolutely very heartfelt. And um, Glenn, what do you think is most helpful to male survivors after they experience trauma 
especially childhood sexual abuse or exploitation yes. through trafficking? Yes, I, you know, I I think um, what Jeffrey said was really helpful. And um, I think finding someone who is prepared to really listen to you is absolutely key. You know, one of the challenges is that um, is in our in everyone's busy lives, we don't sit down and listen to each other and listen to people. And um, you know, actually, it may not be it may not be the counselor or or the doctor or somebody who you think is going to be the one who's best li listening to you. It may be someone that's just like a, just an old lady or an old or or a young man. It might be somebody who, but they they're willing to sit down. And to hear your story um, and don't give up on trying to find that person, because sometimes the first, second, third, maybe even, you know, a ninth person is somebody who's not very good at listening. They may be people who just don't get it. They misunderstand you. They interpret things that aren't there. Um, don't give up because there will be somebody like Jeffrey was saying this. There's there's the authentic people who really do want to help you and are willing to sit down and listen to you. So I think that's the absolutely vital thing. And I um, I think that um, those of us who are, who are professionals in this area, social workers, health workers, and so on, we we need to get trained. But the most important thing is that we know that we learn how to listen, and we all know what we're supposed to do. Let's just do it. Um, so I think that's really important. I think um, if you're part of a, a church or um, a, a religious community that you feel um, supported in, that's great. And, uh, you know, listen to other people, listen to God, see how, if you experience some kind of enlightenment in the same way that Jeffrey did. But if you if you don't, get that in the church that you're part of then move to another church don't be afraid to do that or move to another religious community there are there are communities that will hold you and love you and support you and there are communities that won't uh, that can be too judgmental um i think particularly for boys in this area they the the, the challenge is that you may have some boys who are um who are labeled gay if they uh, confess what's happened to them um, and you have and they may not be gay and that's really hard for them and then there may be other other boys who are labeled gay who are gay or they feel that same sex attraction but they don't need someone pointing the finger and saying you know what have you done you've led this person on mm -hmm. they need to know that they are um that they're okay that they're loved that they're accepted for who they are. Um, and uh, then it may be that they, that's when I'm talking about the type of church that you're part of. Um, mm -hmm. There are some churches who are uh, give people the choice between their sexuality or their, um, or their um, faith. And if you're in that kind of a church, then move out of it because it's not helpful to you in, the long t in your long-term healing. Um, and also sometimes churches can be very unhelpful when it comes to faith because they say you must forgive people when they haven't really they don't really understand what that means I think Jeffrey's definition of forgiveness is really helpful because it's not about it's not, it's about releasing those um, those feelings those things that are holding you down that's really the key thing and so Finding somebody who can help you to process that is really good, but don't get take on the burden of um, pastors and and leaders who are telling you that you um, that you mustn't, you know, really putting pressure on you to forgive when you're not ready to forgive, and uh, just allow it to happen when it's appropriate for you. Um, I think another thing is. Um, if you're brave enough is to to write down your story i think sometimes writing your story can be very therapeutic and it can help you um it may be hard for you to express um your story to somebody 
but actually helping to write it down can be helpful. And don't, again, there's not no pressure on you. Take the time that you need to do it. Take breaks when you need to do it, when you need those breaks. Um, and listen to um, listen to your heart. Um, it may be that there are things that you can process that on your own. It may be that you need to have some support from a counsellor or somebody who's um, it, on that journey. But I think sometimes actually putting it down clarifies things in your head that you wouldn't otherwise have done, have experienced. So those are a few uh, things I wanted to suggest. I think for um, for young boys in particular, sometimes it can be very hard for them to um, to experience um, to, to to know how to express. They don't know the words for it. Um, I remember hearing a story about a young boy, must have been three or four, and he would play in the sandpit and he would build a phallus out of the sand and then smash it. And that was his way of indicating that he that he had experienced sexual abuse. And the uh, the nuns who were working with him, they realized that because they observed him and they saw him and they took time to to do that. They weren't they didn't just ignore it. They they understood that that was what was happening and then they were able to help him and support him. So, you know, even with young children, there's ways of listening that may be, um, may be actually more than just using your ears. There's ways to, that we can do that. So those are some ideas. Um, maybe we should move on to the next question. Uh, that was, uh, if I can tag on to uh, Glenn, uh, what he just, the last thing he just shared, uh, it's, it's uh, listening with the heart and that's what the nuns were doing. Yeah, and uh, yes. yes. And and I, di I did want to, you know, I don't want to uh, gloss over everything. The church world is just a wonderful, perfect place. It's absolutely, absolutely not. <laughs> That's why Jesus came, because <laughs> we're all a mess. And uh, <laughs> and so uh, so actually, my faith community, when this uh, PTSD hit, uh, they had uh, no clue and really didn't want to hear it. And I had to go somewhere else. Uh, basically, the attitude was... Uh, uh, well, that's too bad. Uh, get over it, uh, kind of in a nutshell. And so I just realized that they weren't safe. I still loved them. I was able to connected to them and I stayed connected to them on the level that I could. But I just couldn't go there with them with that. And the Lord was faithful to uh, take me somewhere else. And on the positive side, I met another believer who actually uh worked uh, with my uh, wife at the time and uh, she was a massage therapist and a believer and um, uh, she was that safe person and she wept with me I when I shared the story and it meant so much she was the only person in my life that wasn't paid to listen to me uh, to that point i.e counselors Mm -hmm. It meant so much mm -hmm. as you was Jesus to me. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, for, for sharing that and Glenn for your excellent points. And that kind of brings me back to the, the research that um that we all were a part of and the importance of of that healing journey and getting out of this era of silence and finally breaking that silence by um by looking into a little bit of self-research of what has happened to me, reaching out to other peer groups on even anonymously telling your story, hearing other people's story. That's a great first step. You don't even mm -hmm. have to be public about your story. And, and something that I would love survivors to know is you don't have to be public about your story. You don't have to tell everyone your story if you experience this, but to get that weight off your shoulders, at least find one or two safe people that you can talk to because that will get that burden off of your heart and then just some freedom out there. You don't have to tell the world, but at least a few that you have in mind that you know are safe people that will listen, that will believe you. And what, what the survivors were telling me in the research was um, their, their thing 
what it wasn't we need everyone to be trained we need everyone to be trauma informed it was we need to be listened to we need to be you know talked to like a person we need our human rights back and i think a lot of frontline professionals we kind of jump in the deep end before even addressing those primary um, really important factors of just treat the other person like a human being and with respect, uh, listen, believe. Uh, those are huge factors for mm -hmm. if someone starts healing or if someone goes back into re-traumatization and is re-triggered. And so those are very important things that do mm -hmm. help um, both female and male survivors in the healing journey. So that it has been a great um, first question. So let's go into the next question. How can we ensure that survivors of human trafficking have access to the resources and support they need to heal and grow both within and outside our faith communities? Jeffrey, would you like to start us with this? Sure. Um, uh, just, um, I, I guess it's just like any other uh, product, we'll say. Uh, what uh, we're uh, selling or hopefully giving away by because of the generous people that are giving, but um, is hope and healing. And the same way being out there on the internet, uh, maybe even doing commercials, but uh, not, not just emphasizing, um, emphasizing the, the, the positive, not, not uh, negating the negative, but some kind of balance that has a short story because uh, just like Ina, um, know her story. She um, worked at an orphanage, I believe, in Central America, mm -hmm. and it was uh, just once she was there with the children that had uh, been impacted by sex trafficking, it just changed her world and changed her heart. And I believe um, uh, people have awesome hearts out there. They're just not aware, or um, and not everybody's called to this. But if you are. Um, and just, it's like sowing seeds um, by being out there, uh, so to speak, just like you would be selling anything else. Only this is um, not selling anything. It's, it's sharing and giving away hope and, and resources and pointing people to resources. Um, yeah, and not only for the healing of victims, but education and, and prevention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Glenn, is there anything that you would like to add to that um, on the topic of how do we ensure that survivors of human trafficking have access to resources and support to help them heal and grow? Yeah, I, I think um, I think that, first of all, um, survivors, male survivors need to know that there are resources out there um, that they because I think they often feel because most of the uh, media is portraying girls and young women who are trafficked. And there's very little that says anything about boys. So they need to know that it's it's that they're included, that it's about trafficking of human beings, not trafficking of girls and women. Um, and so, and with the prevention materials as well, you know, we need to think about that. So for example, we've developed some training materials for young children. Um, about sexual abuse and exploitation and we've included boy uh, boys and girls so that it normalizes the idea that boys um, are sexually abused and exploited too um, and I think that's very important so those are some things I think when it comes to survivors they um, I think many of them have no idea that there's stuff that are there there's stuff available um, so I think we need to um, we need to get posters um, for clinics and we need to educate children in school um, and we need to communicate that uh, this is a problem not just for, for for girls but for boys as well and I, I think churches um, churches sometimes feel that they don't want to talk about sex with children because they might go ahead and try and do it um, the reality is that children need to be educated on what's uh, what's appropriate uh, uh, sexual behavior that's going to be helpful to them. them. Um, you know, sexual behavior that's about love and about relationship 
uh, not about um, abuse and uh, and that it's about consent. Um, and those are messages which seem to be have been a little bit lost in our current media. We need to bring that back into focus and say that that's important. So educating children about pornography, uh, saying that pornography isn't real sex. Pornography is actually um, it's photographing and videoing abuse of people um, and, and people need to understand that. And um, uh, if anyone's interested, I've also been involved in um, doing research with men, uh, uh, Christian men in particular, uh, on their sexual behaviour. And it's really important that we don't just focus only on porn, but we also encourage men to behave um, in, a, in a responsible and good way. Uh, and that includes um, not um, using prostitutes. Uh, so that when we, we uh, look at addressing demand, we're starting with ourselves mm -hmm. and saying this is an important topic. And we, we uh, and so it's no good for the churches to be silent about any of this stuff. It's really important that they they address it because if they don't address it, then somebody else will, and it's not going to be someone who's helpful um, to our children. Thank you Absolutely. very much, Glenn. Did you have anything to add to Glenn's points, Jeffrey? Oh, that uh, was just excellent, Glenn, and uh, I agree. Uh, you know, if somebody else is going to step in into the vacuum, uh, you know, and it's not going to be good. And, uh, but uh, just that, uh, you know, sex is God designed it, it's about giving uh, to the person uh, that he, uh, in, in a marriage. Uh, that is the original design in a marriage, uh, the covenant protective relationship to give to them, uh, not to get from them what you can get. Mm -hmm. And that's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To go off of your point, Jeffrey, I think that's really important of, and, and Glenn, that we need to be there for our children, for our communities, because if we aren't, these are the vulnerabilities that are literally putting targets on these children from perpetrators. And this is literally how the grooming process is. Um, they see those vulnerabilities, a child that's not being listened to, a child that is not feeling loved, that is being neglected, that is abused. Those are our most vulnerable children, and that's regardless of gender who we need to put the most attention on. I mean, all the children we need to put most attention on, but if we aren't there for them, they will be. And so we need to be very careful with that. And I feel like uh, for frontline professionals like yourself, Glenn and I, um, we we need to really make sure that we continue to collaborate and to as much as possible to have things open access. So when those survivors do look online, literally a Google search of what is this and what help do I have, they can find these resources that aren't thousands of dollars that are at least you, the research that we have done that is free that they can read, that they can see, okay, I can go here, this could be my next step, this can be the next uh, NGO I look into, into their resources, and things like that. And I think that through that, it highlights our strengths, and it, other, it also covers our weaknesses, because by collaborating and partnering with each other, um, for example, you know, as researchers, we don't have uh, we don't we don't have those safe homes. We don't we aren't those counselors. We aren't those therapists. But through these partnerships, we can say, OK, I can look into the research, but then I can tell a survivor, OK, well, this is the safe home if you need. And and you can go to this um, already vetted therapist or, and you can go to this website to look for these resources. And, and so by kind of partnering, collaborating, I think it really just makes us stronger together. Um, and I, I hope that that can really bring some change in the future for for uh, victims and survivors of, of any gender. Absolutely. And so that, yeah. Uh, and if I could tagline no, uh, on ahead. that, um, it's just, and, and rec I recognize, we all recognize, uh, you know, we're going to have differences um, uh, and we may not agree on everything, um, you know, whether we're in a church or not. Uh, but 
I, I think that if there's a rallying cry in this earth, it's uh, let's protect the children. I think everyone can agree on that, regardless of your faith or no faith or your background. Um, yes. And um, so I so admire uh, Ina and Glenn and Michael and, and everyone here listening uh, to have that heart to do that. Mm. Thank you, Jeffrey. And so to our last question, how can we ensure that survivors of human trafficking are not just surviving, but are thriving? And what are some key steps that we can take um, that needs to be taken into account to create more of a just and equitable society for all? So Jeffrey, would you like to open it up? Sure, uh, mine was just real pointed. Uh, I know there's other things uh, out there. Uh, but uh, what came to uh, my mind and heart was because uh, uh, this is what was very, very helpful to me uh, was um, hearing anyone's story uh, that gave me hope, uh, testimonials, and that could be in any any number of forms. It could be on a short uh, commercial or a YouTube commercial or all the way up to a book or um, and even uh, it would be wonderful to have a movie out there that treated the subject. Um, with dignity and compassion, but would instill hope. Um, I love inspirational movies. My favorite stories in books and movies are true stories mm. of people that have overcome. Uh, they just speak to me so much. Mm. And uh, when I'm at a low spot, uh, sometimes I'll I'll put that on. I like the Cinderella Man with Russell Crowe about James Braddock in the late 20s, early 30s, uh, who was a uh, champion boxer eventually, but uh, he went through some very hard times uh, and was able to overcome. And uh, the reason why he said he knew what he was fighting for, and that was milk, because he loved his children. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, for sharing that. Um, Glenn, is there anything that you would like to add on how we can ensure that survivors of human trafficking are not just surviving, but thriving, and mm. what we can do to create a more just and equitable society for all? Yes, that's a very good question. I think um, in terms of a just and equitable society, um, you know, sometimes I think we think that we're um, moving towards that and other times we realize that we're not and we need to be honest with ourselves um, and I think the church in particular needs to be a good example in that we need to encourage everyone in the church or in our, whichever uh, faith we're a part of that that's something that we can only do if we're committed to it um, not it's not just going to happen accidentally so I think um, that means that we need to be better at listening. That's one of the things I think that we've talked about that, that, that's become a recurring theme in this <laughs> podcast. But I think it's so important that we become better at listening to people. We may not be experts in, we cannot be experts in other people's experiences. People are experts of their own stories mm -hmm. and they know their stories, but we can't, do, as professionals, that's not what we can do. As churchgoers, that's not what we can do. As pastors, that's not what we can do. But what we can do is be a good listener. So let's all try to do that a bit better. Thank you very much, uh, Glenn. That, that's absolutely so true. And uh, I would like to add that um, I think something that we really need to start pushing more and more to do is survivor inclusion, survivor voices, making sure that they're, they have a seat at the table. We write a lot of policy programs, projects globally, locally, and we're not even listening to the very people that we're trying to help. And I think one of the most important things to do is is to bring to the people to the table that that these things are about because they they know what they need. We can't just tell them, "Oh, you need this," and and then it's just going to work out. And it can be a completely a complete thing that is is what they didn't ever want or need in the first place. And so I think actually, like you said, listening to them bringing them to the table, including them um, into projects, into policy, into change, 
um, or into just these podcasts or webinars, something mm -hmm. that we can show the public that there is change, that it is okay to share your story. And I feel like once a survivor or victim are going through that healing journey, um, and they're, they are finding some healing and some inner growth and post-traumatic growth through that. It's, I find it really important to start those hobbies or those things or those games or those toys that bring you joy to start healing that inner child that, um, that everyone has. And, mm -hmm. and one of the most impactful little moments that I had when I was interviewing a few male survivors was, um, before the abuse started for one male survivor, he always wanted a train set and he loved trains and he just, he loved it as a four-year-old little boy. But once the abuse started that, of course, he never had a train set. He went through all this trauma and it was only until he was around 65 that he goes, you know what? I'm going to buy myself a train set. And he bought himself one and he set it up and he made this huge thing and it brought him so much healing and joy because it healed his a part of his inner child and it let him be a kid again and it let him heal that part of himself and it let him bring other passions um, from traveling to cooking to spending time with friends or family, whatever it was. But I really recommend once, a, once anyone goes through any kind of traumatic experience, also heal that inner child because that's what's really going to have a holistic healing approach to the person mm -hmm. and what's really going to bring you joy at the end of the day because we're not meant to just do our nine to five go home eat sleep start it all over we need to have some joy and peace love mm -hmm. um, in our lives and that's what i really hope for for anyone that is going through anything that is painful any kind of trauma that's pretty much everyone on the planet. Um, so then hopefully, you know, they can heal that, but also their inside, uh, their inner child as well. Very, uh, very impactful stories, Jeffrey and, and Glenn. And, uh, and I would like to ask you, Jeffrey, um, you had mentioned a book. Could you please tell us a little bit about your book and how can we get it? Well, yes, uh, please. And uh, yes, it's out there on Amazon. It's in um, paperback, uh, Kindle ebook, as well as audio. And uh, Ben Hawk, he did an awesome job on the audio. Very professional uh, man uh, out of New York City, young man. And uh, yeah, just after writing and rewriting the story uh, so many times, I listened to it for the first time when he did it. It, it was just like... Uh, a new experience for me mm -hmm. in, a, in a good way. It brought healing to me you know, by hearing that book in a different form. Um, and so I just uh, wanted to say that, you know, um, I can't take credit for anything uh, good in the book. I just had the privilege to be able to write it. And uh, I believe it's just uh, this book's uh, a gift uh, of, of hope uh, to uh, just uh, not only victims, of course, the victims, but uh, the people that love them and advocate for them and um, and even perpetrators. Uh, that There's hope. Uh, there's a way of escape for you, for each one um, out of darkness and, and into that place of light and love. And uh, I'm just so thankful to have been able to be a part of that. Uh, it was just orchestrated through of uh, people, uh, many people like Ina, she was a part of, of, of the process and uh, other wonderful people. And um, Patrick Erlandson is another one, a uh, filmmaker in Southern California. It's uh, uh, he, he makes uh, films and also has an organization called FatherCon um, that uh, helps us equip dads to be good dads at the ultimate uh first line of defense against sex trafficking. Um, and I, I would like to share just one quote um, uh, that he, uh, just a short one out of the recommendation of the book, if it's okay. And, um, and it is, um, th this treasure of a book does not demonize. In fact, it's a refreshing response to the reasonable question, where was this loving God when I was being abused? 
Uh, Jeffrey tells of his experience in which Jesus shows him that he was there appealing to the trafficker and abusers uh, to turn from the evil in their hearts and was not turning a blind eye to the victim uh, nor to the twisted heart of the victimizer. And uh, it's just, uh, he gave voice to what I wasn't able to say that, uh, uh, and so, yeah, just, um, I would have never written the book to, <laughs> to try to make money. It was too painful to write. Um, but uh, my motivation was that um, it would help people. And uh, so, it, yeah, so it, 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 it is out there on Amazon. I imagine you can buy it anywhere in the world. Um, and so you could just type in The Way of Escape, uh, my, my last name, Tenet, T-E-N-N-A-N-T, and Amazon, or go straight to the uh, Amazon website and type in The Way of Escape and my last name, Tenet, and uh, you'll be able to find it. Do you, you know, want to show us, show us a copy of it? Oh, yes. Thank you, Glenn. I appreciate that. And uh, this is uh, the, the front cover of the book. Sorry, it's a glossy cover. <laughs> uh, so, but uh, hopefully you can see it well enough on the uh, video. And uh, this is a, a brilliant picture of uh, actually uh, a precious woman from the UK uh, that uh, did this uh, cover for me of a, a young man running out of a horrible place into the light. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Jeffrey, that is absolutely incredible. And I'm so happy that you're able to put your, your story into words and hopefully into song in the future. Yes. That's fantastic. And, and Glenn, is there anything that you would like to share with us? Any recent work or resources? Um, yeah, I would. Um, the, first of all, I'd like to tell you about... Um, a, a guy called Perry Power, who's um, a survivor of um, sexual abuse um, from his grandfather and wrote his own book. Um, and he has started a group of about 20 people who are getting together weekly to talk about writing their own story. And um, I think it's a very uh, exciting uh, way of exploring your story in a supportive group of people mm -hmm. and um, uh, and then also I want to encourage you to have a look at this book so this is one the, the one the first of a trilogy of um, edited volumes that are aimed at people Christians really working to address the issue of trafficking this is the first one stopping the traffic the second one is called, um, can you say, oops, yeah, there we are, Finding Our Way Through the Traffic. And then the third one, which is should be coming out any time now, it's not quite finished publication, um, is called Standing Back from the Traffic. So they're all um, play on words, of course, but they're all about navigating some of the complexities of a Christian response to sex trafficking in particular, but other forms of trafficking too. So um, some of them are written, some of the articles are written by theologians, others are written by social workers, people working directly with um, survivors, and it's an extraordinary collection of um, essays. So I will en would encourage you if you're a Christian and you're working in this sphere, then please, um, whatever area you're in, please uh, have a look at these books. They're available from Regnum Publishing, R-E-G-N-U-M Publishing. And you can get uh, soft copies of the first two anyway um, for about six pounds, which is about eight US dollars. Fantastic, Glenn. Is, Very good. Glenn, is that uh, out of the UK? It is out of the UK, but I think some of these books are now available. Um, I think that they, they're available um well, because the soft ones, of course, are available anywhere in the world. So you can just you can just download them, um, but you and you have to pay for them, obviously. But um, it's uh, it allows you to pay uh, internationally. So thank you so much, Jeffrey and Dr. Glenn Miles, for sharing with us your time and your expertise on this topic. Do you have any final thoughts, Jeffrey or Glenn? Oh, I just I want to thank Ina and Glenn and Michael uh, 
for hosting the webinar and, and this audience. And thank you all for your hearts and compassion and uh, the opportunity to, to join with you. I love um, that Jeffrey uh, has spoken so much about the word hope and this it can often feel like an area which is so dark and hopeless. So I just love that we can end this with um, that sense of real hope, that there is hope. As you heard about today, the journey of male survivors of trauma, including those that have experienced human trafficking, is complex and multifaceted. It is essential to uncover and identify the social interactions that harm and aid male survivors' recovery and healing, as well as the barriers that hinder disclosure. By providing a safe and supportive environment, empowering survivors by reclaiming their agency and fostering community engagement, we can ensure that male survivors have access to resources and support that they need to heal and to thrive. As we continue to explore and address these challenges faced by male survivors, it is essential to prioritize trauma-informed care and to create a more unjust and equitable society for all regardless of their gender. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. So I would like to thank all the survivors for their commitment and bravery throughout both studies, as well as my partners and field experts that have dedicated so much time to helping uh, male survivors in their own fields. So here we can see the publication and both of these are available. Um, please feel free to reach out to me if you would like a free copy of the, of the journal. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, and thank you very much, uh, uh, Glenn, and especially Jeffrey, for this uh, wonderful exchange. Um, and allow me to ask a few questions. Uh, I don't know whether we will be able to answer all of them today, uh, uh, but still, I want to tell you that uh, uh, seeing the interest of speakers, seeing the interest also of uh, attendance, I, I, I definitely think we, we should start a series of uh, webinars with you, Anna, and uh, with uh, survivors, because we want to include you in this uh, uh, series of webinars. So allow me to ask a, a first question. What can faith-based organizations do to improve our response and support mechanisms for victims. Or oh, possibly, uh, are there any gaps in researching victims and survivors of sexual abuse and exploitation that we need to draw more attention to? And uh, I think especially when we think of uh, family uh, trafficking, uh, trafficking within the family which is, of course, very uh, <laughs> difficult. Uh, but uh, how can we uh, uh, research this and uh, uh, provide for uh, prevention and uh, uh, rehabilitation? And, and, and then also another thing, how can we address uh, lifelong ramifications of traumas? Because we, we heard Jeffrey speaking about uh, PTSD and uh, discovering what PTSD was for him uh, many years after uh, this traumatic experience. Uh, and then another question I would like to ask is, how could uh, not only writing books such, such as Jeffrey did, uh, but composing and playing music as well as painting serve as creative outlets in the recovery process? Uh, uh, and then another question, how could we promote an interdisciplinary approach in research, training, and recovery? Uh, and then allow me two more uh, quick questions. How can prevention be more direct? Not only posters, but face-to-face -face conversations. And the last one, but that, that will be, of course, possibly a different topic. How could we best support victims and survivors to pursue vic justice, justice through criminal and civil claims, criminal prosecution and civil claims? That's it. But uh, you see, <laughs> so many uh, issues are coming, 
And I must say, I'm very glad to see Glenn, <laughs> Dr. Glenn Miles, very happy to see you live. Uh, uh, and uh, many thanks for your <laughs> contribution. Great to be here. Yes. Okay. Uh, and now, uh, back to you. Uh, but uh, thanks again. It's very impressive. And uh, I think uh, what uh, also we, there, if there is one word we could keep, hope. Go ahead. Up to you. So thank you so much, uh, Michael, for starting that off. And it's such a pleasure to see you, Glenn, again. Um, so I'll go ahead and start off these questions. And Glenn, feel free to um, jump in after and give us your answer as well. Mm -hmm. So faith-based organizations can play a critical role in improving the response and supporting mechanisms for survivors and victims of child sexual abuse and human trafficking. Some of these examples can include education and awareness, prevention programs, supporting victims after their trauma, collaborating with other organizations, and advocating for policy change. So faith-based organizations can provide education and awareness training on the issues to their members of their communities. This can include trainings on recognizing the signs of abuse and trafficking, as well as how to respond to a disclosure afterwards. They can also implement prevention programs by promoting healthy relationships, boundaries, safe practices to reduce the risk of abuse and trafficking, and how to properly do consent, respectful relationships, and even safe internet use. They can also provide support for victims. This can include counseling, support for legal services and medical care, as well as connecting survivors that have similar experiences. These faith-based organizations can collaborate with other organizations such as law enforcement, social services, and community organizations to coordinate a joint response together. And then they can also influence and advocate for policy change and improve the response for child sexual abuse and exploitation through trafficking by supporting legislation, strengthening protection services, and advocating for increase of funding for support services. Uh, Glenn, do you have any additions to the answer? Yeah, for this I think question? One, one thing that's worth saying is that um, faith-based organizations haven't always commanded much respect amongst the secular organizations. Mm -hmm. They've tended to feel that they're, they're not really, they're just doing the fluffy stuff around the edges and they're not taking things seriously and involved in policy and, and involved in, you know, seriously caring for people. There's some big concerns about the way that we Look after victims that we that we um, are forced, you know, basically we're forcing them to believe things, and so on, rather than seeing it actually spirituality as an integ integral part of what um, what we uh, of holistic care of people. Um, so I think that that's um, something we need to get over by proving to um, other organisations that we that we that we're up to the mark and we, that we can do this as well as any anybody. Um, but that can take some time. But I, I do think it's, it's important that we are aware of that and that we're not afraid to say this is who we are and and actually provide evidence in, for example, um, spirituality being a benefit rather than something that's um, seen as inherently negative. Um, we've done some research with the Butterfly Longitudinal Research Project in Cambodia um, that, that demonstrated that that the spiritual faith component of the care of victims was actually very powerful in um, in providing support to um, people, and so it shouldn't be ignored, but it should inf it, it, conversely should be embraced. So I think that's re that's really important. I know we've got lots of other questions, but I just <laughs> wanted to I just wanted to add that. Thank you very much, Glenn. So I'll continue on to the next answer. So about uh, the gaps in researching for victims and survivors. So there are several gaps in researching this that need more attention. And for example, a couple of them are the experiences of marginalized groups. There's a lack of research on the experience of these groups, people with disabilities, LGBTQ plus individuals, indigenous communities. And there is a need for much more research and understanding their unique challenges and barriers faced by these groups in accessing support services, as well as what is their experience, um, just like we had done with male victims and survivors. 
Another one is the impact of technology. With the increased use of technology in our daily lives, we do need more research on what is this impact on victims and survivors, especially children. Um, we should also look into the best practices for intervention and support. There is a need for this and what is effective counseling and therapeutic approaches and the best way to support services through the criminal justice system. And finally, a really important one would be um, prevention strategies and safeguarding practices. We need more information on what are the proper implementations for these um, research on effective prevention programs, as well as their impact on community level interventions, social norm change as well as super important. And uh, so there are several gaps that we need to look into. And, and Glenn, do you have any gaps that you would like um, looked into? Yes, I mean, I, I think all of those things you said are very, that's a very comprehensive list. I, I think um, just enabling us to do research with uh, young men and boys is really important and often the funding isn't available to do that. Um, the assumption is that it's girls and women who have the, um, who who need the, uh, to us to do research with when actually, of course, it's all human beings. Um, I think I, I've, I've said that before, but it it is worth reiterating that this is an important um, area that we we need funding for. It's it's impossible. We, we at the moment most of the funding that that we've been involved in has been very small scale. Um, we've only been able to do uh, to do research with uh, small groups of people because there hasn't been the funding available. So we need to find um, large scale funding to to be able to do large scale uh, uh, comprehensive research. Mm -hmm. Yes, very true. And it's so important to have this evidence based research to bring forth in programming and projects um, internationally and locally, because that's where the real potential change can come in. Um, so to answer uh, Michael's next question on how can we address the lifelong ramifications of trauma, I'm addressing these um, ramifications require a multifaceted approach that focuses both on prevention and intervention. And this can look at early intervention, which is very critical in understanding these lifelong ramifications of trauma. Um, this could look into trauma-informed care as soon as possible right after the abuse or the exploitation is disclosed or discovered. And this can really help survivors process their trauma and develop coping skills that would reduce long-term impacts. Um, having access to mental health services is also very critical. Um, Evidence-based therapists um, that can help survivors manage their symptoms of trauma and help develop healthy coping mechanisms. Peer support can also be a very powerful tool in addressing uh, this trauma as well as providing services such as peer support, mentorship programs, and other forms of social support. Um, as well as by addressing these barriers, we can help survivors build a stable and fulfilling lives by providing them with example, with education, vocational training programs, as well as supporting um, survivors and finding stable employment. Um, and another point that I would like to bring up is, uh, is advocating for policy change, as I had mentioned before, and increasing funding, as Glenn said, for these uh, research projects for mental health services, for these safe homes, uh, because we need to prioritize the needs and rights of survivors. And uh, by providing early intervention, these support services, uh, peer support, education, and employment, policy changes, we can really help uh, build more stable lives. However, we need to remember that these are people first with dreams of hope, of having a family, of getting an education, a job, and therefore we need to meet and support victims and survivors through their journey so that they can have this feeling that they're living again not just stuck in their in their past and in their mm. pain. Um, Glenn, is there any other? Um, um, just one other comment, have? which I think we've we've yeah. um, touched on before, mm -hmm. is that really everybody who works with with boys and men at any level mm -hmm. need to have some training and understanding on yeah. on um, on trauma informed care. But actually, that we know that in resource scarce environment that's not always possible mm -hmm. but what we can do is to train people 
in good listening skills yeah. um, and rather than giving advice um, which can, which may or may not be harmful um, it's better for people to just learn that they need to have um, big ears and small mm -hmm. mouths <laughs> um, that's a really important um, aspect of, of this yes and that's exactly what we had heard from from Jeffrey, the, how important uh, listening is and being listened to, being believed, makes all the difference in that healing, in that journey to um, uh, to healing. And uh, the next question that Michael had asked uh, was about um, about uh, writing and composing music and other creative outlets in the recovery process, and so. Uh, creative outlets such as writing books like Jeffrey did, composing music, playing uh, playing music, painting, uh, those are very valuable tools in the recovery process for those that feel very attached to this. Um, creative outlets allow for the expression of emotions in a safe and creative way. And this outlet allows to share your stories and express themselves as a way to empower and to heal. And I've also seen this done in third person where someone writes themselves as a character and this helps write the story without being directly connected to it as the author and allows for a space for reflection while minimizing triggers at the same time. And this act of, crea of creating can be very therapeutic and give you a sense of control, agency, especially as that was taken away during trauma, during abuse and exploitation. Um, and engaging in these activities can really help a survivor or victim gain a deeper understanding of their experience, help build self-esteem and confidence, especially when they see that their work um, is validated by the public um, and the survivor can really feel a sense of pride and accomplishment in that. Um, and these creative outlets really allow for uh, survivors to connect with each other and with others uh, to provide, provide a bigger sense of community and support and build relationships, which is really key in mm. that healing journey. Uh, Glenn, do you have anything that you would like to add to this? Um, just a little bit more. Um, I think um, getting out in nature is really important. I think mm -hmm. people have understood that. We're, they were understanding that more and more now. Yeah. Um, and also, of course, just walking and hiking and getting some kind of exercise can be very, uh, is one of the things that's proven to be very helpful for people in uh, dealing with depression and long-term um, mental health challenges. And uh, the other thing that, um, that occurs to me as well is the, um, is work, uh, working with animals, um, having yeah. pets, um, getting alongside horses. Um, I'm currently supervising someone who's working with um, children and using, uh, working who, who themselves are uh, interacting with horses and just seeing how that impacts their spiritual lives. And I think we, we, these are things that we still don't know very much about, but mm -hmm. we we know from the from working with children that they, uh, boys and young men, that they would love to um, to be around animals, and often it can be very healing for them. Yeah, I've seen some of those um, those in the United States. Those are very impactful and have a very big um, thing into healing. Um, so the next question that Michael had asked is, how can we promote an interdisciplinary approach in research, training, and recovery? Um, so promoting this in research, training, and recovery um, requires collaboration and communication across fields and disciplines. Uh, so researchers from different fields, such as ecology, social work, uh, law enforcement, and public health can work together on research projects, um, on programs to gain a more comprehensive understanding of the issues. This can include sharing data, collaborating on the studies, pooling resources, and conducting interdisciplinary uh, research. Um, professionals working in these fields that are related to these topics, such as medical professionals, social workers, lawyers, um, can also receive training to better understand how to respond to it such as joint training sessions that combine law enforcement, medical staff, social workers can really help draw on these expertise, especially in collaborating of who do we contact next? Who's the 
who has these support services. And so by bringing everyone together, they now know who to contact um, and who has those services. And so by cross-sectional partnerships between government, NGOs, private sector entities, we can really help promote this inter interdisciplinary approach to address these issues. And partnerships can really help bring together the diverse perspectives and resources needed to create these really comprehensive solutions in more of a holistic way. Um, and so Glenn, would you, do you have anything that you would like to add to this? Yeah, again, I think one of the things that I can see more of at the moment is uh, conferences where they have a variety of different sectors represented, mm -hmm. where people can learn from each other and also network effectively. So that that's always an important thing, rather than us just staying in our silos um, with uh, uh, the, our profession, own professionals to actually get out and connect with others is really key. Mm -hmm. um, the next question Michael had said was, how can prevention be more direct, not just posters, but face-to-face -face conversation? So while posters and other forms of advertisements can be really effective in raising awareness, these conversations are a lot more powerful in preventing these crimes. And so for example, schools and educators can incorporate these discussions on child sexual abuse and human trafficking into classrooms, into the lessons, and providing students with a safe space to learn and ask these questions. Uh, teachers can invite experts in the field to speak to the students uh, directly on these issues, raising more awareness both for the, child, the children and for adults. Um, community outreach such as churches, youth organizations, community centers can organize events by bringing um, community members together to discuss these issues. Um, they can talk to experts, they can do workshops, interactive activities to help raise awareness for their communities, as well as learn about practical tools um, of prevention. Um, and then professionals who work with children, such as teachers, doctors, social workers, um, can receive trainings on the signs of child sexual abuse and exploitation and what steps to take when they suspect that a child has been abused or exploited. Um, and for example, in the research that I was conducted through my thesis dissertation that both Glenn and Michael were on, we actually identified a lot of new indicators of how to visually see these signs in children, um, behavioral indicators, emotional indicators, psychological indicators. So it's very important to know what signs to look for. Um, and finally, parents can receive training. They can talk to their children about child uh, sexual abuse and trafficking prevention that is age appropriate, um, as well as teaching them boundaries. What is body autonomy? What are warning signs? to make sure that a safe adult doesn't make you keep a secret. And so these little tricks here and there can really help both uh, teachers, parents, and adults protect children um, when faced with these situations. And Glenn, do you have any um, kind of prevention tools that would be, that you would uh, highlight? Yeah, I'm very happy to share with you a couple of flip books that we've used. So flip books are basically um, large books that can be used in classrooms or with small groups of children. Um, I'm going to put it into the ch chat now, a couple of websites that you can check out. Um, basically, um, good, uh, basically, the Good Touch, Bad Touch is a story about three children uh, and we deliberately made sure that one, one of the children was a boy, so it normalizes the idea that sexual abuse of boys can happen as much as girls. Um, and so that's uh, so that's available. It's, it's been translated into a wide range of languages now. So if anyone is interested, then please um, do contact me, and we can see um, we can uh, see how we can help you uh, use it and access the material. So I'll also put my email in case um, you haven't got it. So that raises a very important point, Glenn, and I heard that a lot in the research itself. It's this need to be seen um, as much as we want to say, you know, posters aren't the solution. And and um, but 
seeing yourself represented in these posters, in these advertisements, in these commercials, however th uh, people put these uh, programs out there, it's really important to have that diverse representation, whether it's a girl, whether it's a boy, um, LGBTQ, whether it's a minority group, um, indigenous, we need to have representation of all um, of everyone so that everyone can see themselves in that knowing I can ask for support, I can tell my story, I'm able to disclose and someone is there to listen to me because if they only see a little girl, then that really cuts out so many of our, of our global population thinking, I can't ask for help, I can't get support because there isn't anything available. So thank you for bringing that up, Glenn. And that leads to our next question of how can we best support victims and survivors to pursue justice um, through criminal or civil claim. And so I would like to begin this by saying supporting victims and survivors of child sexual abuse and human trafficking to pursue justice really needs a comprehensive approach that takes into account their unique needs and challenges of each individual. It really needs to be tailored on how to support that survivor through the process. We need to provide emotional support. Um, pursuing justice can be very emotionally taxing process for survivors, and it's very important to promote this emotional support throughout the entire process. Um, and this can include accessing mental health services, support groups, or just knowing the triggers of your um, the person that you're helping and knowing when to calm them back down and regroup when needed or just when to stop the process entirely to let them feel those emotions and then get back to that process. We also need to educate survivors and victims on their rights. Uh, many survivors are not even aware of their legal rights or the legal procedures um, or how to pursue justice. And it's really important to educate them on their legal options, on what resources they can take so they can have an informed decision. Um, survivors may need legal assistance to pursue these criminal and civil claims, such as filing police reports, finding a lawyer, navigating the legal system. So we really need to assist in just making that a little bit easier. And when addressing these logistical barriers by pursuing justice, this might involve traveling, court appearances, and other logistical challenges. And so it's really important to address these barriers by providing transportation, childcare, other forms of assistance, even um, social or emotional support during that process, as I had stated before. Mm -hmm. um, but policy change is really a big critical role in supporting the survivors because we need to really change our laws, our regulations to just make it easier for survivors to seek justice. Um, as well as increasing funding for victim services. And finally, I wanna really make this a point that we need to hold perpetrators accountable. Um, this is an essential part of the justice process. Um, this can in involve working with law enforcement to bring perp perpetrators to justice, um, supporting the survivors in pursuing these claims, but also believing the survivor if the perpetrator is someone that you won't really guess right away. This could be a female perpetrator. This could be their mother, their grandmother. This could be a teacher. This could be the Sunday school teacher. This could be the the mayor. It could be anyone. And when we say, oh, it can't be them. It would never be them. That is because they have groomed not only the child or the person and the family, but they've also groomed the community to make them believe that to the point where, okay, I will commit this offense against this child, against this person, and the community around me will back me thinking, oh, I could have never, or they would turn a blind eye. And so we really need to hold perpetrators accountable in order to have any kind of next step uh, that holds any justice for survivors. And and Glenn, would you like to, to mention something as well in this? I think just um, in terms of the um, the court system and so on, it's often, it's particularly in the in developing world, there's an un, there's a need for the court system to be more child friendly mm -hmm. and, uh, for example, having um, being able to use videos in court rather than ch children yeah. where they're exposed to the perpetrator in court is too, is too overwhelming. So um, things like that, we just need to continue to work on. Um, mm -hmm. trying to get justice done in a way which is not intimidating but is careful and child-friendly. 
Yes, exactly. And I remember uh, speaking with a lot of survivors and then during my trainings that I uh, do with law enforcement, it's this question around interviewing uh, uh, the, the survivor, a lot of the times it happens uh, over and over and over again. And to have a trauma-informed interviewing techniques, it's to make sure that, you know, they know the next steps, that you're with them throughout the entire thing. But also it's really important to get those audio and visuals immediately so that they're not count constantly retelling their traumatic stories. And then when you do go on, you're mm -hmm. not asking the same questions. You're building off those previous questions to get mm. all the information needed for those court and judicial uh, proceedings later on. Because if we just keep re-traumatizing uh, the victim, then how are we any better than um, their exploiter? Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Anna, uh, Glenn, and uh, special thanks to Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey Tennant, I greatly appreciate your willingness to share your story with us today mm -hmm. and your courage and hope are truly inspiring for helpers, victims and survivors alike. And allow me to uh, make three brief quotes of the three speakers. Uh, first, Jeffrey, it won't be a dark side. It will be full of hope because when you just been able to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and you begin to fear no evil because God really is with you. This is the greatest comfort and strength we could ever have in our lives. And now, Glenn, I know to quote from you, I love that Geoffrey has spoken so much about the world hope. Uh, mm -hmm. It can often feel like an era which is so dark and hopeless. Mm -hmm. I just love that we can end this with that sense of real hope, that there is hope. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And now, Anna, uh, finding a safe and trusted individual to share your story will help lift the burden that you've been carrying for all these years. You do not want to feel trapped in a jail cell within your own body. Just find one, two people that you trust and that you that will really help your soul. Finally, if you have symptoms of abuse or exploitation, it's really important to address those. Don't minimize your story to yourself. Let yourself feel, let yourself heal. This will be a journey, a long one, but there is healing and there is hope, end of quote. And now, in concluding this webinar, I would like to express my gratitude also to Yves Reichenbach, who is next to me, Emmanuel Piluso, and Lindsay Boudreau for their contributions. And in a few days, you shall find the video recording of this webinar with subtitles in seven languages on our website, as well as Vimeo and YouTube. And uh, thank you for being with us, uh, supporting our efforts, as well as helping survivors. And we hope to see you at our next webinar uh, on Tuesday, the 27th of June at 6 p.m. Central European Cent uh, Summer Time, with Anna explaining her five-year-long research on male survivors and a male survivor's life. You can already register, and I hope it will be part of the start of a series, because definitely we need to include survivors uh, in uh, our webinars. We need to, to include them, and uh, we can feel that it's also helping them, helping other survivors, and helping other people who are trying to, to take care of them. But uh, please, Anna and Glenn, would you have a, a final word on this? Up to you. I, I love uh, the I love the word hope, and I think we need to dig into it more. I think it's a yeah. beautiful word. Okay, enough. <laughs>
<laughs> um, thank you so much, Michael, for this opportunity to share my research and my work and my passion with your audience. Uh, thank you as well to your organizing team for logistics. They're absolutely incredible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Glenn, uh, for being a part of this, um, of this journey and this process. Uh, both of you have been so impactful in not only my journey, but in my research, making sure that it's trauma-informed, that it's victim-centric, that we're always putting the survivor at the core of why we do all of this. And so thank you everyone for listening. Um, and I cannot wait to see you all again in the many series that we have in the future. Okay, and now uh, goodbye, best wishes, and hope to see you again on the 27th of June at 6 p.m. Thank you. And all the best to you, Anna, all the best to Glenn, and all the best to all uh, listeners.